So welcome all to this New Bias Academy course on ImageJ in Fiji Macrolinguage. My name is Anna Klemm. I'm working at the Bioimage Informatics Facility at SciLive Lab in Sweden. And before I start, I would like to thank Fabrice Cordelier, who contributed a lot to this material, and also to Giovanni Cadone and Ofra Golani. So in this session, what we will do is to first have a look on the biological data set and the image analysis problem that we would like to solve. And then I will introduce you to how can you talk at all to Fiji. So what is the macro recorder and what are the built-in macro functions? And then the core part of the lecture will be to create step-by-step -step a workflow that optimizes this image analysis workflow. So the image that we are working with are images from the cell atlas or the human protein atlas. And the aim of this project is and was to determine for each cell a protein where in the cell it is lo localized. So what they did was they generated antibodies against 12,000 human proteins and then did an immunostainings using 22 cell lines. And then after automated confocal microscopy, they resulted in 82,000 images. And you can see some of these images here on the right. So you can see they have three channels. One is the nuclei in blue, then they have the microtubules in magenta, and then they have the protein of interest, which is marked by the antibody and which is labeled in green now. And then the question is to know for all of these proteins, like where is this protein? So for example, here in the upper left image, the protein is everywhere in the nucleus, whereas in this image here, the this protein seems to be only in the nuclear membrane. And um, for the session of today, let's, I, I thought we would focus on exactly that one subset of, pro, of problem. So let's say we would like to, to ask and automatically quantify whether a protein is um, accumulated in the nuclear membrane, yes or no. And then what we could do is to automatically find where is the nucleus and then to automatically find where is the nuclear membrane, then to measure the mean intensity in the nucleus and the mean intensity only in the nuclear membrane. And then you could calculate a ratio out of these two values. And because this is a course on image day macro writing and not so much on this workflow, what I would like to do in this course is to just focus on this part on how do we automatically get an outline of the nuclear membrane and then when we have this um, outline how can we measure the mean intensity within this selection. Before we really dive into scripting I ask you to do a first exercise and the exercise is that in Fiji try to find a workflow that allows you to measure the mean intensity in nuclei and then also the mean intensity just in the nuclear band. And the way you could do this, or the way I imagine you to do this, is first try to get the selection of the single nuclei. So for this you need to threshold your image, you need to do a connected component analysis with the analyzed particles command. And then for one single nuclei, try to get this rim um, covering selection. So for this you can use the make band command and yeah try to play around with this a bit. So let's have a look on the workflow together. So that is my image, it's a three channel stack. So the first channel are the nuclei, the second channel is the signal, and then the third channel are the microtubules. And then the first thing that I want to do is to split this stack into three individual images. So I run split channels. And this creates then three individual images. And I actually do not need the microtubule image, so I close this. And then these two I would like to rename so that it's easier to know what's inside. So I want to rename the format channel one I want to rename to nuclei and the former channel two, I would like to rename to signal.
And then we will continue working with the nuclear image since this is our marker. And what I want to do now is to smoothen the image and then to threshold the image to get a binarized image. So to smoothen, I'm using a median filter because that's a, yeah, it's an edge preserving filter. It goes very well. And I take a radius of eight pixels. That's what I just tried out before. And as you can see this value, yeah, it looks quite nice because the nuclei get quite nice smooth, but the overall shape is not changed too much. Then I can um, set a threshold, intensity threshold, and I will use one of these automated uh, methods to determine threshold. So as you can see, the default method is not so great because there are quite many holes and here even like at the border, there are holes, so that is not perfect. So I try to find a different method that is, is appropriate for this data set. And um, yeah, this one method seems to be good because yeah, we have only one hole, all other nuclei seem to be detected quite well. And then I press apply to really create the binarized image. Then we have the binary image and I would like to fill this little hole. So I'm running the fill holes command and then it's gone. And yeah, this looks to me like a quite good mask. So I see all the nuclei, they look um, yeah, correctly detected. And now the next step, I would like to get the outlines of all the nuclei. So one single outline for each nucleus. And I do this running a connected component analysis, which is the analyze particles command in Fiji. And here, what I need to do is I need to tell Fiji to add the ROIST and to the ROI manager. And I also added a minimum size in pixels. So I would like uh, to exclude particles that are smaller than 2000 pixels, because uh, knowing basically the biology of my sample, I know that 2000 pixels cannot be a nucleus in these specific images. Okay. So uh, we have now all the Roy's in the Roy manager. And I would like to first change a bit the properties only. That's not uh, crucial. That's only that you can see it better. Okay. And then, yeah, we can see now these single outlines. That's quite nice. And then now I zoom in into that one here. And here I said, let's pick one. And for this one, let's do this outline that just picks the outer border of the nucleus. So I do two steps. I first shrink it and then I make a band. So to shrink, I use a large command and I use a negative number. So I using, I'm using minus 10 pixels to slightly shrink the nuclei selection. And then I'm using the make band command by 10 pixels. And then you get a second line and our selection is really only what's in between these two lines. Last thing I urgently need to do is to update the ROI. So this will replace the former ROI that there was. So this was the ROI detecting the nucleus by this new band shaped selection. And yeah, I just want to show it to you again. So this is now the final ROI. Now that we have the ROI, we of course want to measure with it and uh, we want to do this in that signal image. And so first I want to set what I would like to measure. So I go to analyze set measurements and then I tell Fiji that I want to measure the mean gray value and I want to display the labels. 
So then when this is set, I make sure that the signal image is active. I make sure my ROI is active. And then once I've done this, I press M for measure. And then it uh, opens up the results window where we see the label and the mean intensity in the signal image within this ROI of the band. So this session is about how to automate these kind of workshops. So basically we want to move away from clicking and uh, we want to teach Fiji of how to do this automatically. And probably the most important command that you need for this of today is the recorder. So there's the command record and then it opens up the recorder and the recorder records whatever we do or most of the things we can do in Fiji and translates it into uh, the language for Fiji. So important is to check that we have the ImageJ macro language so it will record um, workflows or steps into the ImageJ macro language and this is actually also the default. And then once we made this sure, we can just do something and see what the recorder is recording. So um, I think it's good to show you this with a command that is not within our workflow, a montage. So the montage is sorting now our three images of our stack and creates one image that has all these three channels next to each other and what we would like to do is um, we want to have three columns in one row and I would like to indeed have a scaling factor of one actually probably you have different values and you can change them and let's have a slight border and the border then should have a color of uh, white so I will use the foreground color in my case because my foreground color is white at the moment. Okay and then let's move to the recorder so we can see that the recorder was recording this command of making montage but and this is very important that also records all the parameters that I was setting so for example that I had these three columns one row uh, scaling of one and the border width of two. Okay, so what can I do with this? I can now press the create button and then the same command will open up in what's called the script editor and we will see uh, why the script editor is so convenient later on. But for now what we could now do is basically open a new image and then just press run and it would do the montage now for this new image. Now obviously for one single command this might be not so attractive but I guess it's very easy to imagine that it gets much more attractive as more commands you have. And then okay that's already nice and the last thing that I would like to show you also now which we also will not use in the following workflow but which is super good to know is the batch processing. So um, what you can do is to go on the process batch and macro and then this window helps you to run a command on all images of one folder and then automatically generates output and will save it to whatever folder you choose. So we can try this out. So we can now choose this command and copy it here. And then you can mm, choose input folder so I will use the set atlas subset all the image that we have here and an output folder and then it uh, will what it basically do it will 
automatically open images, but then run this make montage command and then automatically save the montage to the output folder. So let's do this. So it's actually doing all this in the background, so we cannot see so much, And but it looks like it's already done. So I will go there and then you can already see in the preview that it made all these nice montages. And it also looks like there are different images where it was doing this, yeah. Okay, very important thing to know about the batch processor is um, you, I mean, super nice, super easy to use, but you have not full control with this. So let's say you would use the split channels uh, command as first command. That is the first command that we use in our workflow. And you would use this in this batch processor, then yeah, what, like how do you choose which of the split channels will it save? Will it save all? And I can tell you it will not save all, it will save only the first channel and so on. So you, batch processor is nice, but you need more skills to really mm, determine what it should do precisely. Good, but let's move back to our workflow. So, of course, what you could do now is to do all the steps for our workflow, which were like um, splitting the channels, renaming them, filtering, thresholding, and so on. You could uh, now record them. So you, you do all the steps and leave the recorder open in the background. And to save a bit of time, I was doing this for you and you can find these files under these catch-up files. So there's this recorded IGM. So what I did was basically recording the workflow, press create, then the, all these commands were showing up in my script editor and then I was saving them. And importantly, when you save your workflows, you need to have this .igm ending. So maybe let's clean up first. And now I'm opening it. So for opening it, just drag and drop it into Fiji. I again will change a bit the font size. Good. And let's have a look on these commands together. So what I was doing is I was splitting the channels then I was renaming the channel one or the image of channel one. I was renaming it to nuclei and the image of the channel two of the former channel two, I was renaming signal. And then I selected the nuclei image. I was doing a median filter with the radius eight. So all of this was recorded. I chose the Huang Dark auto threshold method. And then I pressed apply. And when you press apply, then basically these two commands are automatically recorded. Then I was uh, saying fill holes. I was analyzing the particles. Again, our parameter of um, 2000 and the fact that we want to add it to the Roy manager were recorded. And then I was selecting one particular nucleus. Uh, I was shrinking it by 10 pixels and then I made this band shape like selection with a band width of 10 pixels. And then importantly, I was updating this particular ROI, which was before the uh, nuclei ROI. And so I was updating it so that it's replaced with the ROI that is now covering only the nuclear membrane. And then for measuring, I was first uh, setting the measurements, um, saying I would like to have the mean intensity value dis um, measured. And then also I would like to have the label of the image displayed. Then I was choosing the image that where I want to do the measurement. I was activating the ROI that I would like to measure. And then I was finally pressing measure. Good. And with this, I would like to go to my slides. So um, what I was showing you here was how basically the main message was that there is the recorder and how can you use it. And because we need the recorder to 
discover the commands that we need for our workflow. And what I would also like to point out is that um, you can always use the recorder and then save your workflow. And like, even if you don't want to go a lot into scripting in the future, the recorder and then creating a document in the script editor and saving it is super important for yourself, for your documentation and for reproducibility. So in this exercise, I would like to ask you to try out the recorder. So you should open the recorder and record the workflow that we discussed, or at least some steps of it, and then press the create button. And then this will open up in the script editor and the script editor press the run button on, an, on the original image to see that it's how it's running through all your work workflow. And let's go back to the recorded workflow. So what we can do is to open again the image and then we can run it. And I find it always pretty fascinating how kind of all these windows uh, appear and does all this measurement. And uh, yeah, and then the final results shows up. So I think that's that's pretty cool. But now, uh, of course, uh, our enthusiasm basically is is stopped quite fast when we try to do this for another image. So let's try this out for another image. Let's close everything. And open another image. So let's see a, maybe this one. So this has a different name. And then when we try to run it, then it splits the channels. But then yeah, there's this error. And it says no window with the title seven uh, C one seven eleven D six one found. And so why is this happening? So in our workflow, we were splitting the channel. This is done, but then it searches for this very particular file name, which contains obviously the name of this old image. And then when we look at these three images then obviously they contain the uh, new file name and then uh, the like Fiji cannot find this particular image and then it gives this error that we have just shown. So to repair this and to work on this we need to use variables. I will now do a like, super basic introduction to variables. And for this, I open a new script. So I go into my script editor and say new. And then very important, you need to also here determine the language. So we want to do this in the image a macro language. And I double check the font size. Okay. So what you need to know is a variable always has a name and some content. So let's say your variable is name is my variable and then the content would be a number, let's say 500. And then very importantly in the image macro language, since it's Java based, every line needs to be ended with a semicolon. So this variable contains now the number 500 and we could do a second variable and let's say this would be two and then what we could do is some calculations with these variables. So I could say, I could create even a third variable and say the content of this third variable is my variable number, like doesn't, doesn't have a number, my variable plus the second one and do this calculation. So this should be 500 times two and then the my variable three should contain the value of 1000 and I can see what is in the my variable three, what is the content by printing it. So I will close a bit what is in the background. And so let's see what how this looks like. So I'm printing it now and to to execute what is now in my script, I need to again press the run button. And indeed, so 
um, we see the number 1000 in our log window. So 1000 is the content of my variable three. Okay, so uh, also very important to know is what are comments. So you can comment something out with these two slashes, meaning everything that comes behind these two slashes will not be executed. So if I try to do this again and run it again, then it runs and assigns these variables. So it kind of creates them and fills them with the values, but it doesn't print it because the print command is behind the two slashes. And you can also see that the color changes to green. So that's called the color coding, color encoding code. Okay. And so we use actually these commands very often to document what we are doing, to explain a bit better what we are doing. So I would like to now introduce you to what's called string variables. So here we had numbers and uh, like variables that are filled with numbers. And now we will look at variables that contain strings. So maybe it's called my string. And a string is any kind of text. So it could be a single letter or it could be a word mm, or it could be an entire sentence. Like in, an entire sentence, including spaces and symbols and whatever. So the standard sentence is this. And then again, to um, see this in the log window, we need to print it. So we could uh, now print out the string number three and run all of this. So we see still the old printing, the 1000, and then we see the printing of the my string three, which is hell word. And so to mini summarize this, when you have a string, uh, so some text content, you always need to have these quotation marks. So whenever you have quotation marks, then uh, Fiji knows this variable contains a string. And just a side remark, like compared to other languages, you do not need to specify what kind of variable, what kind of type your variable is. So here, this variable would contain a string and here it would contain a number. And in, as you can see here in Fiji, in the image day macro language, you can just um, assign these variables and don't, you don't need to specify before that it will contain a string. Okay, then maybe we can just comment these things out. And um, next uh, thing that I would like to show you is the plus operator when you have strings. So when you have strings and you use the plus sign, then the strings are kind of glued together. I mean, obviously when you have a plus sign with the numbers, then they are added up. But when you have the strings, they are simply glued together. So let's try this. We can have a new string. And this would be my string plus my string two. And we print it out. Then it will glue together A and dog to a dog. And as you can see, uh, it really glues them together directly. So there's no space and nothing. So if you would like to have a space, what you could do is, for example, include one. So this basically now glues together a plus an empty, like a space, uh, um, a string containing only a space plus, so again, gluing together the content of my string too. Let's try this out. So now, we have the um, space between A and dog. And something that I would also like to show you is that you can do this print clear, and then the lock window is always cleaned up before you, um, yeah, it's always cleaned up. 
Mm -hmm. So final things that I would like to show you is, let's say you would like to do um, the following. So in image a micro language, what you can do is kind of dirty um, gluing together numbers and texts. So we could do, we could print out, for example, my variable, or let's say doc, my string, plus my variable. So basically you are, what, what it's doing is, is gluing together the doc with a 500. And what is um, to point out here is that my string is a string obviously and my variable is a 500 is the 500 is a number and uh, what's happening is that the my variable is now basically mm, translated into a string and then both of them are glued together so this would be string plus number and this is something that would not is a bit dirty and would not work in other languages Okay, let's do small exercise. So let's say you would do something like that. You would say A equals two, three and B equals five. And now we want to print out A plus B. Then you can guess what is the output of that. And the output will be 35 because we have the quotation marks here. So whatever is inside quotation marks is a string, is treated as a string. And we said that when we have a string, then the plus symbol is uh, concatenating, it's called, so glued together, it's gluing together these two strings. And um, maybe another last point, which is a popular mistake. So let's say, we would now, we have our string uh, variable called my string four. And then somebody does this. Then what would the output be here? So the output would be not the content of the my string four variable, but really typing out my string four. So let's see this. So indeed, it just prints this to the lock window. So next exercise would be that you try out variables. And so the way I imagine this is, we saw that we have these two lines and in these two lines, you are expected to now use a variable instead of typing in the name directly. So the first step is um, that you create a variable with the name title and uh, you assign the string of your image name. And then uh, the task of the exercise is that you replace these two yellow parts with the, using the variable title. And what I will do now is to first copy these, two these few lines in a new window. So I opened a new script under File New. And then when I have the new script, I change the language to image jmacro. And then I copied now um, these lines. And I also want to directly save this. So I would like to save this. Yeah, maybe under workflow, new bias. And then when I save, as I said, you need to do it a IGM. So before I do anything, I want to um, create a variable that contains the file name. Oui. So this is the file name from our example image. And I close with a semicolon. So the variable co um, called title contains now a string. We can see this with the quotation marks that contains our image name. And then what we could do now is to use this variable um, here in these two lines. So let's try this out. So I will, just that you can see this better, I will copy that line. 
maybe already um, inactivated by commenting it out. And then let's see what we can do. So this line contains this one string, which says channel one and then that file name. And this would be exactly the same as writing this one. So we basically dissected our string and gluing, glue, glue, them, glue it together with a plus sign. So that would be exactly this line and this would be exactly the same. And then obviously, instead of uh, entering here the file name, we could use the variable title. And then for the channel two, we could do exactly the same thing. So again, now I am jumping over this because we have seen this. So um, I'm using again the variable called title. So let's try this out with our file. So I'm using now again the same uh, image and run it. And I did a typo. So we will talk about a bit uh, about errors in a second, but it's pointing me to line seven and it says it's missing. Uh -huh. So it has some problems here and indeed I forgot to enter the plus sign. So let's do this. So we wanted to glue together these two strings with a plus. Good. So we can try it again and let's see. Yeah, so we're splitting the channels and was renaming, renaming them successfully. So nuclei signal. And then obviously what we should be able to do is now, if we have a new image with a different name, then at least what we can do is uh, to change the variable that contains the image name to the right name. So at least we had now to change it only once and not in these two lines. But yeah, we will work on an automated way, obviously, in a few moments. Good. So I adjusted the content of the variable title and then my little code snippet is also working now for the new image. So it's nice that we need to change now the name of the image only once and then we can use this in these two lines here. But of course, we, what we would really like is that Fiji tells us automatically the name of an active image. And of course, this is possible. So to know how we can do this, what you need to know is that there are these what's called built-in macro functions. So the built-in macro functions are all available functions in the, in the image and macro language. And we have seen while using the recorder, we can get some of these commands and some of the functions, but we cannot get all of them. And then this website lists all. So what we need for our problem is a function that is called getTitle. So the get title function, it says uh, it returns the title of the current image. And that is exactly what you need. Of course, you need to know that the title is the image name, but then we can use this. So in our workflow, what we can do is to introduce now this get title function. And then also what I haven't pointed out yet, but while you are typing, then you can see that these windows open. So this is the code, code auto completion. And we would like start typing this get title and then here's the get title function that appears and then you can also see that there is the same documentation as there was online appears also in this little window so we can double click here to insert it and what we would now do is we would take the function and um, place it here so the get title function then gets the image name and the output of, of the function would be saved in our variable title. We can now try this. So let's open image. 
and um, then we just run it. And as you can see, it is successfully splitting the channels, but then also renaming them. Let's talk a bit more about this built-in macro functions. So we've seen the get title function, which gives us the image name. But there are also other functions, other types of functions. So for example, there's the stack set channel function. And we give it the parameter one, and then it activates the channel number one in a stack. So it does not have an output, a real output. And in our get title function, we had an output, which was the image name, and then we saved it in a variable. Then there are also functions that look like this, like the get dimension function. And here, this get dimension functions has output, which is the width, the height, the number of channels, the number of slices, and the number of frames. And we would save it in variables that we pass on as parameters within these brackets. So we could name them in any way we want, but the order of how get dimensions outputs this information is in this order. And um, also, of course, there are common source of um, mistakes. So when you use such a function, then of course you could uh, use the wrong spelling and so on. But then also what's quite popular is to use extra brackets that you don't need or use the wrong kind of brackets. And luckily, we get errors, quite good error messages in the image day macro language. And when you look more precisely at the error, then you can see that it would get you the error in which line would you find this error. And then also using these kind of brackets, it shows you where it expects the error to be. So in that example, it says something is wrong with this bracket. And indeed, that's the example where we had the second bracket. So important message here is, yeah, really read the error messages before clicking OK. Yeah, and we also had a look at the auto completion. So actually, when you use this and double click then at the right command, then you already avoid these uh, stupid spelling errors. So in this exercise, I would like you to simply catch up with the script and in include the get title function. And then I would also ask you to try out what happens when you run this function here, the get dimensions, channels, height, width, slices, and frames. So you can use the print function to um, control what is inside of these variables. And then I asked you to look uh, in the slides or on the built-in macro function websites or in the auto completion how the correct use of the get, di get dimension functions is and what, do you, uh, what we are doing wrong here. For now, what we have done was to split the channels and rename them. And in the parts before, we were now normalizing these file names that we do not need to enter um, the one specific file name. And then the next steps of our workflows are that we take the nuclear image, filter it, set a threshold, binarize it and then uh, fill the holes. And then we use the analyze particles command to get the outlines of the nuclei and added them to the Roy manager. And these uh, steps I would like to now include in the script. So I can go back to my script editor and go to the um, recorded workflow. And then basically what we can do is just copy these lines until that the point where we really select a specific ROI. So I just copy them and paste them. And then this is also a good, uh, this is a good moment to annotate our workflow. So we could say the first step was to split the channels and normalize the image names. And then here, what we are doing now in the new steps is to filter the nuclei image and threshold. Set a threshold, set a threshold. 
And then the last step is, I mean, the last step for now is to uh, um, get the rise of all nuclei in the ROI manager using this analyze particles command. And let's also save it. Good. And however, I would like to do one thing, and this is, um, I would like to give the user the opportunity to change this parameter of 2000 pixels. So imagine um, the user now have, has new images of a new cell line, and in this cell line, the nuclei are much smaller. And then uh, it could happen that we exclude nuclei because we have the size limit. So what we will do is to uh, again copy this line that you can see what is happening. But we will um, use a built-in macro function that is called get number. And then we can uh, have a look at the documentation and it says get number it displays a dialog box and returns the number entered by the user so that's good and i use it so um it has a prompt that is the text that is displayed when we have um when we ask the user for the number and then it has a default value so let's try this out so we could ask the user to enter a minimum size of the nuclei and then as a default value we could use these 2000 and um we uh, so this will open a dialog box i will show it in a second and then uh, we need to save whatever the users enters in a new variable. Now we call it min size. And this will save the output of this dialog window. So let's have a look. So what you can do is to select only that one line, go to run and then run selected code. So this will execute only this one line and then, okay, we get this dialog window. Here's our prompt where we say enter min size of nuclei. And here are our 2000 pixels default value. So um, what happens now if I press okay, then the value of 2000 will be saved in the variable min size. And if the user changes this value to a different number, let's say 700, then this uh, 700 pixels will be saved in the min size. Okay, so now this is uh, already nice. We got the number from the user, we saved it. And obviously we now need to use this variable in our analyze particles command as it was recorded. So this I prepared before, I copied it just for you to compare it. So the original line was this. And then again, as a first step, we could dissect this um, long string into three strings. So again, um, in the command, basically we have two strings, one is here and one is here, and we are working now on the second string. And the second string I now dissected into three parts, which is one string, glued together with a number, glued together with a second string. Okay, so that would be, this in this line would be exactly the same as in that line. And then obviously what we still want to do is now to exchange this 2000 by the minimum size variable. So we can have a look and we first save it. We'll open again one of the images and then run it. So it's now asking us for the minimum size of nuclei and we could maybe really enter a very low value and see whether these small particles are included. So I will do two. And then, so these are my ROIs and we can for now show them all. Yeah, 
And then you can see that these two particles are not excluded because the minimum size entered was very small. So now we are already gotten quite far. So we uh, split the channels and renamed them. We created a binary image and uh, we uh, run the analyze particles command. And we gave also the user the opportunity to enter minimum size of the nuclei. So for the next step, what I did when I was recording, it was that I selected one specific uh, nuclei array I uh, shrank it by 10 pixels and then I made this band shape like selection with a width of 10 pixels. And then finally I was updating this one ROI and by that replacing the nuclear ROI with the nuclear membrane ROI. And obviously what we want to do is uh, we want to um, repeat these steps, not only for this one specific ROI, the ID7, but we want to repeat it for all ROIs that are in the ROI manager. So what we need is to loop our code and we need something that's called for loops. So this is now to introduce you to for loops. And so what are they and how are they used in the image day macro language? And let's have the following example. Let's say you would like to express your enthusiasm for a new bias academy. So you could write not new bias academy is great. And since you're so enthusiastic, you would want to do this not only once, but several times. Let's do it three times. Okay. Of course, now if you print this, then it will repeat this statement. But obviously, this is not a very good way of doing this. So we want something automatically that is um, repeating pieces of code in a controlled way. So to do that, um, there's something called the for loop. So when we start typing for, you already get the template of such a for loop. So let's use this template. And if you press return, you also get a second uh, curly bracket. So what do we have here? So this is uh, basically a statement that helps us repeating code. In the round brackets, you can see how uh, the code is repeated, some rules. And then in the curly bracket, you will put what you want to repeat. So we want to repeat this new bias academy is great statement. So what I did now was just copying it inside the curly brackets. So this part of the code will now um, repeat it 10 times. So if you run this, it will be 10 times. And I will also uh, use again this print clear statement in the very beginning to always clear the lock window. Okay, so let's have a look on this part of the for loop. So this one tells you where we start our loop. This one is how long will we get going with our loop and this is a step size. So we start and basically it's a bit fancy way of counting. So we start by setting i to zero and then we ask is i equal, uh, smaller than 10 and if yes this will be printed. Then uh, we will increase i by a certain step, step size. And this way of saying i plus plus is the same as writing i plus equals one. So i plus is our step size and our step is one. Um, so this is how we are counting, but we can also use our i. So we could, for example, just print it. That is actually helpful for understanding the loop. So let's run this again. And then you can see, okay, we started with i equals zero and we have a step size of one. So the next time i is one, two, three, four, five, and so on, we end up with nine. The next one, step one, one would be i equals 10, then i is not smaller than 10 anymore, and this will not be printed anymore. 
just as a, another example, let's say we would increase the step size to two. Then obviously you will only get five steps. Zero, two, four, six, eight. When we go back with this new knowledge about for loops to our workflow, then we said, okay, we need to loop now these four lines in such a way that they are valid for all roles in the Rhyme engine. So what I'm doing is copying these four lines for now to my newly built workflow. And so this is still uh, not good because we are selecting this one specific row and then do everything on this. So we, what we want to do is basically to create a uh, row or rows for the nuclear membrane. And we'd want to do this um, for each nucleus. So we somehow need a for loop, obviously. And we need to do to know several things. So we need to know how many ROIs do we have in the ROI manager? So how do I get this information? And we also then um, need to know how to select the different ROIs in the ROI manager. So to get the number of ROIs in the ROI manager, um, there are these ROI manager functions and like, these are is a group of functions that all have to do something with the Roy manager. And there's this one which is called Roy manager count. And then the documentation says it returns the number of Roy's in the Roy manager list. So that is, that is exactly what we want because we want the number of Roy's. Okay, so I double click to get it. And again, to kind of save this, uh, number I want to create a variable and I call it nRoyce. And then mm, we need our for loop. So I start with the template, press return and start moving everything in inside the curly brackets. And what I do is to indent the code. So everything that is um, inside my for loop is indented. And that is something that you do not need to do in Fiji. So it's not mandatory, but it's uh, it, it's still uh, very important to do so because it increases re readability of the code. Okay, so this is um, already looking quite nicely. So we start at i is equal zero because when we use this ROI manager select function to select the very first ROI, then we need to say select zero because the very first ROI has the ID of zero. And then, so of course, then in the loop, in the for loop, what we would do is then to use the I, which starts by being equal to zero. And then, so this is good for the start and then the step size is fine. So I told you I++ means we are increasing I every time by one, by one, by one step. And then we just need to tell where to stop. And here we are using our nRoyz um, variable. So again, a number of ROYs, let's say you have 10 ROYs in your ROY manager then n rise would be 10. But since the last Roy, so the 10th Roy will have the ID number nine, we need to stop uh, when we are smaller than n rise. Okay, so let's try this out. I will open the file again, and then I will run everything. And so it asks me again for the minimum size of the nuclei. And now you can see nicely how it is looping through the Roy manager. And we can just open any one and have a look. Okay.
So we are now at the final steps of our yeah, core workflow. And what we want to do is basically to measure uh, like the mean gray intensity in our nuclear membrane ROIs using the image that is, we call signal. So this is the main thing that we want to do. And then obviously we'd like to also save these kind of measurements and do some preparation steps. And this is all what I would like to show you now. And okay, to do the measurement, uh, of, of obviously to do one single measurement of one ROI, what you could do is to activate the ROI and then press measure. However, there's a little trick if you want to measure, measure all ROIs, and that is if you make sure that all ROIs are deselected, so that no single ROI is selected, then you can press this measure from the ROI manager, and then automatically all ROIs will be measured. So we can try this out. So we can go to our workflow and we say we would like to measure something. Measure within signal image. And then if you remember in the recorded workflow, what we did was to first set the measurement and say, we would like to measure the mean intensity and we would like to display the label. So this is important to do. And then obviously also we would like to select the signal window because that's the image that we want to measure in. So I just copy these two lines and copy here. Okay. And now we can do these two, the kind of this trick of saying we want to deselect whatever there is in the Roy manager. I mean, we want to not have any Roy selected. That's what it means. And then once we have done this, we can run the measure command to measure all Roy's of the Roy manager. Let's have a look on this. Okay, so I'm opening an image and it should ask me for the minimum size. It's looping over all ROIs and it's doing the measurement for all 14 ROIs. Okay, that's nice. And then let's continue with the preparation steps. So I go back to my slides. Okay, so this is quite nice. And of course, now we would like to save the measurement. And this is really now the, the time to think of, okay, do, are we doing uh, everything correct? And are we preparing our macro in the right way? And in particular, let's have a look on the Roy manager. Let's say you have done this measurement now for one image and you open up a new man image, then inside the Roy managers, there will still be the Roy's of the old image. And it will do then the measurements also for that ROIs that are from the old image, also for the new image. And that is something that, of course, we don't want at all. So before we do anything, we want to, in our workflow, we want to clean up the ROI manager. And then now in this last step, what we did was measuring something. And then we would also like to make sure that before we do anything in our macro, we want to make sure that there are no, no, no old measurements in the result window. So basically you could just copy these two lines from the slides and say, okay, I would like to um, prepare my, like prepare for new evaluations by doing these two steps. So now we are sure that whatever we measure and whatever we have in the end is really from that image that we had opened. And we can then run everything, get our final result table, which only contains measurements of that particular image. And then finally we can save the result now that we are sure that results are clean. So for saving anything in Fiji, there's the save as uh, command. So you can see that it has a format and a path. And 
the format is in this case, so we want to save at that uh, moment, we want to save a result, our result window. So we need to tell it that it, the format should be results as a string. And then we enter the path. So let's use this, uh -huh. I'm opening the documentation instead. I want to double click here. So we are want to save in the uh, <laughs> we want to save uh, the results, and then uh, for the path we can basically just copy here. And the only thing that you need to be careful when you enter a path is okay first. We need to say this is a string. Then we need to say this is what is the complete path. So we could call it result CSV. And if you're attentive, you see that somehow is is a string, but the color coding is not magenta. And the reason is that we have these slashes, and you cannot have a single slash in a, within a string. So what you need to do, and this is a bit dependent on whether you're on a Mac or on a Windows is that you either use two, two backslashes or what I could have also done is instead of two uh, backslashes to use one slash. So I'm using two backslashes and then we can have a look whether all of this is working. Actually, I think I will leave this open because then we can have a look whether uh, results window and the row manager are properly cleaned. And I will open an image and then now I will run. Okay, so in theory we should still have only 14 measurements, yes. And we should have only 14 rows in the row manager. Okay. And then now the exciting part is to check whether we have our results and that was already. So we, you can drag and drop such a result file just in Fiji and then you get the measurements in Fiji. Um, what we will do next is some extra steps. And the first one is that we have uh, for now, we have a workflow that runs on your active image. So we were opening an image and then we press run and then it's doing these things very nicely. But in our image folder, we have, uh, I don't know how many, but we have uh, several images. And we would like now that it opens automatically an image, does all of this, saves everything, opens the next image and so on. So we need a, basically a for loop that works over all of our images. And what you need to know for this are um, some essential commands. And one is the get directory command. So the get directory is a user input and the user selects a directory. And then the output of this function is a path to this directory. And then once you have the path as a string, you enter it to the, uh, to the function get file list. And then the fi get file list gives a list, an array of all your images. And we will talk uh, in a second about what are arrays. And then once you, we have this kind of list of images, we can do a for loop one over the next uh, images in this list and um, do our workflow. So let's have a look on arrays. So we have seen before variables that were containing one number or one kind of string. And the special thing about arrays is that they can have several values. So they have basically different compartments where you can save um, individual values. So let's have an example of this. So this is a array with the name fruit and it has four compartments. 
and then you can fill up these compartments. So you could say the first compartment uh, contains the string apple, the second orange, and so on. And also here, I want to point out that the index of the first compartment is zero. So a bit like in the Roy manager, the first Roy was zero. And very useful functions are, if you want to print such an array, you cannot just pr say print fruit. This would not work. What you need to do is to, to use the array print function. So you say array, array print fruit. And especially uh, important for looping over such an array is the dot length function. So if you say fruit dot length, it will give you how many compartments there are in your array, and then you can loop over it. So now let's see how we can use this knowledge about arrays for our workflow. And so I go back to this example. And here what I told you was we can ask the user to, to choose the directory where are the files. And then using the file list function, we get an array which lists all the images. So it lists all the image names of all the images in that directory. So this is an um, array and every compartment, in each compartment you have one file name. And then we can uh, loop over this uh, file list array and um, the first image will have the ID of zero because we start indexing with zero. And then to know how many images are in our directory, we use this dot length function. To go back to our workflow, um, this is how it would look like. So we again also would use this to be asked the user, we get the file list, and then basically we will take all our of our code and loop over it for all our files. Ideally, you would use a function and make it a bit more clean, but this is just an introduction of image and macro writing. Okay, what else do we need to consider? So um, maybe first the saving. When we were saving before, I was just uh, calling the files results plus the file ending. And this of course now would result in that we, every time we have an image, we, will, we would overwrite it. We would create a new file called results every time we run over an image. And that's not, of course not nice. And so what we could do is we could um, insert the name of the image in our file part for saving. And by that we will have one specific file for each image. And then also what we need to consider is the preparation. So we uh, already had included that we clean the Roy manager and that we um, clear the results. Also, what we need to include now is that we first close everything that is open. And this is obvious because when we have like the first image, then in the end, we still have kind of these split channels open. And then these would be still open when we open up the next image. So that's bad. We can close all open images using this command. And then finally, um, we indeed need to open our image. So when we were not doing this batch processing, we were op always opening an image, then we had an active image, and then we were pressing run in the script editor to run our workflow. But here now we need to also automate that the image is opened. And then what is nice to do is to print out which image are we working on. So to include this in our workflow, I will now switch back to my desktop. Okay, so to use this now in the workflow, what I could do is to be a bit lazy and just copy it from the slides. So I copy these two lines, or actually these three lines until the curly bracket. So asking the user for the directory, getting the file list and starting the loop. I will just copy it inside my code. And then you can see there's the curly bracket open. And then I want to really have all of this inside my curly bracket. And I make sure I indent it 
to really know where to close the curly bracket. And then while closing, you can also see in the script editor, it shows you which curly bracket are you closing here. That's very helpful. And then also I would like to save now this workflow under a different name. So always use the .igm ending. Okay, so that is uh, now the looping. And let's look at the other steps that we need. So we said we need to also close all images, not only clean the ROI manager and the clean the results. And then obviously we should do this before we open any image and before we get any image names. So I will move this down. And then we need to now open the image. And again, the open path is the path of the directory plus, so concatenate together with the first element or the element in, the, in our file list array. So the first one would be zero. And then it's also nice, as I said, to display which file we are processing. So again, we want to do this before we get any image name. And let's also document it a bit. Um, open image. Well, that maybe is a bit obvious. Okay, so we are opening opening it. We are printing it out. Then once it it is open, we are getting the title and we are splitting the channels and we are doing everything. And then until the very end, there we said we need to. Mm, save it now under a specific name. So again, this is a string from here to here. That is our path. And we would like to now insert uh, our variable holding the image name. So what we can do is um, we can use the title variable. Also, we could use the file list f very um yeah variable and then let's do an underscore here that we get a beautiful file name okay and with this i added everything that we need i would like to point out one more thing before i start this and this is that we have now with um nest for loops so we have one for loop here that is looping over all our images. And we have one for loop inside that for loop, which is looping our, over all our ROIs. And here it's really super important to use different counter variables. So here we have an I, and here we have an F. So I like to have F for file. And because otherwise you really mess it up. So you, you would start then, um, with a F setting F, uh, or if you would have an I here, you would start setting I equals zero, do some steps, and then here you start modifying the I. So that is messing it up, So um, and it's a very popular mistake. Okay, and then, so the, my output path I was this folder. I cleaned it now for demonstration, and we can now run this. And I would need to go to my files, which are here and here. So I'm picking the directory, and now it's uh, working on the first image in my folder, and it's asking for the minimum size of the nuclei. And it was doing something with results, but it's so fast and it's, uh, cleaning it uh, immediately but you can see them the results appearing very quickly and then as you can see it's now working through all of these files in the directory but it is asking for the minimum size of the nuclei for each image and this will be the last thing that we will work on in this workflow so i will actually now not click 
over all files. I think these were 12 files or so, but I will cancel it now. Because um, since we are saving already for each single file, for each single image, we should have something in our output folder already and we have it. So you can see that every CSV file has now the name of the image plus results. And you can just drag and drop them into a PG also to, to reopen them. Again, ideally you would get rid of this .tiff um, file um, ending. You can do this very easily in Fiji, but uh, yeah, this is an introduction into image macros. So we want to be a bit fast. So I guess everyone was slightly annoyed that when we were running our macro over all images in the folder, then for each image, it asks um, what is the minimum size of the nuclei. And this is actually not only annoying, but it's probably also wrong because when you consider in one folder, you have probably all images of one experiment um, recorded under the same, using the same settings of the microscope. And then you, you don't want to use different parameters for your analysis of for each single image, but you want to have one set of parameters that you use for all images of your folder. So ideally what we would like to do is to ask for the minimum size of the nuclei in the very beginning for the very first image, and then um, to use the same parameter for all images. And so what we want to do is what's called a conditional statement so we want to ask the, so this was the line where we we're asking the user to enter the number and we want to do this only for the very first image in the folder and so what you need to know for this is what's called an if statement or conditional statements so conditional statements are parts of the codes that are that are executed only if certain conditions are true so you could ask, so you have in this example here, you have a variable called i and uh, this is zero. And you could ask, is the variable i bigger than 10? And if this is the case, then the lines that are in the curly brackets are executed. If this is not the case, the lines in, inside the curly brackets would not be executed. You can also, of course, ask if something is smaller, smaller or equal. And then very important, if you can ask, is something equal, then you would need to use two equation marks. And you can also ask if something is not equal, then you would use the exclamation mark and the equation sign. This is basically all that you need to know for this workflow. But of course, uh, for your future scripting, it is very, important to know that you can also have like basically different cases so you can ask if something is true and then to execute something else if this is not true or you can ask for different alternatives so if i is has a certain value do this and if it has a certain other value do that and so on and so let's do this for our uh, workflow. So this is very simple. So we have um, this min size, we are asking for this and um, we want to only ask if it's basically the first run of our loop. And we, if we go up again, we get remembered, reminded that the first run has then the F discounter variable F equals to zero and then we could go back and say if f equals to zero and again I'm telling you that to ask if something is equal you need these two equation marks and then um, we need the curly bracket and inside the curly bracket we move whatever we want to have executed only in this specific case. So for the first run, it will ask uh, for the min size. 
and save this and for the other runs mm, this will be saved and then or like already before and then used so we can test this again uh, save so i should not need to close anything because everything should be closed within our workflow so i'm picking the right directory and i should be asked only once now and then for the next images it should just run yeah and it does this so that's good so with this we've reached the end of the session so i hope if you learned that uh, there's the macro recorder there are the built-in macro functions you've seen what variables are and you've seen how to ask for user input we have looked at the looping over code and we've also looked at how to loop over several images in a folder um, and we've used the arrays for this and then in the final step we have seen the conditional statements in form of an if statement last point that i would like to point out is the bit of general good practice when coding so uh, what i tried to use was uh, using meaningful variable names so i've used for example the min size when i was asking for the minimum size of the nuclei then if you have variables that you use more often in your script then it's good to assign it in the very top of the script and also what we have done is uh, to use comments so we documented what we are doing using the comments and this is good for you when you come back to your script like after two weeks or so or after two years and of course also for others then uh, for reproducibility it's really very important to have this initialization or preparation code that we also had so to close the windows to clean the raw manager to clean the results table and so on um, we have not saved quality control files but you should do this actually so you can quite easily save the raw manager or you can also create overlays of the roys over your images and save them under a new name and then we have used file names that refer to the original files so when we were saving the result windows in the end then we were taking the original file name of the image for saving the result csv file um, then what we have not done and what is also very important is to save the parameters used with uh, other results so we, you see, can see this now in the next slide actually i've done this in the end so in our example, we are asking the user to enter a minimum size of the nucleus. So and if this, one, this is changed, this will not be documented at all in the macro as it is for now. This would be very bad. Okay. And also save the macro itself and document its version. And then also consider sharing your macro when you publish something, you can um, share it probably as supplementary information. So where to continue from here? So first you can look a bit more detailed on the slides. So I have not covered everything that is in the slides. And then um, you can also check out what I call the sneak preview IGM. So I have one macro that is the continuation of the workflow that we have until now. And I told you in the very beginning that it would be nice to not only measure the mean intensity in the nuclear membrane, but also in the nucleus, and then to calculate the ratio. So this is what I tried to do then in these um, added steps. And from the scripting side, what I tried to do is to show you how to customize the result window, how to get basic statistics of ROYs using the get statistics command. And then I also included the wait for user um, command just to show it to you. So this is basically very simple. So it just opens up a small checkbox where, or a small uh, dialog where you need to say okay as a user. And then until then the macro is, is stopping. And that is quite easy way of debugging your code or wait for user interactions. 
And then further, of course, you can continue uh, with the resources that are online. So there are many resources online. There are, of course, other YouTube videos. And there are, um, on the ImageDay.net, there's an introduction to macro programming. And there is the forum uh, on the image dot sc so there there will be a thread link to this video and of course you can also ask questions there and it's a very active forum and then there is um, the bioimage data analysis book which you can um, freely download and there the chapter three is only about image j macro language and with this i come to the data resources so we got the images from the uh, human protein atlas and you can find more information in the paper and also online good and with this i would like to thank you all for your attention and uh, i hope you had fun